Our guest today is calm yet captivating. He offers a wealth of knowledge and unique perspectives on life and business alike. His charisma and charm effortlessly draws us in and leaves us eager to hear more. Despite his youth, his professionalism and strong work ethic shine through. In addition to his successful investments in popular podcasts, he continues to inspire and educate audiences around the world. Please welcome Scott Farrow. I don't think I've ever been introduced so kindly. (laughs) So, and I want to mention, this is like episode three for us, Mm -hmm. and I've been like begging Scott to let me be on his podcast, and he's probably on episode like 500, and I (laughs) still haven't been a guest on his show. So what's the name of the podcast? (laughs) Yeah, so we're coming up on episode 150. We have the Pursuit of Property podcast. We started back at Iron Key with you guys at the start of COVID. Wow. Um, Yeah, and it's our podcast is just aimed towards new people. Uh, getting into the real estate industry, Mm -hmm. um, either as investors or as realtors. Um, But it tends to be a lot of listeners are agents as well that have not taken the leap in the buying investments. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Are you doing more investment side business now or real estate? So I made a dramatic change in my business last year. Um, and I partnered back up with Jason Pritchard <laughs> at Pinnacle. And so I spend a bulk of my time uh, running the acquisition side of his business. And so we're doing about 10 contracts a month on the wholesaling, flipping, wholesaling side. Mm-hmm. And then I'm still helping some people as a realtor, uh, but it's kind of more of a side hustle for me just with the amount of uh, you know deals and leads and time I have to dedicate to to keeping the team running at a high level. And I actually, I read your reviews earlier today. I think it was on Zillow. And I was surprised at how many sellers um, give you such high reviews and say how phenomenal you are. Because we get a lot of reviews from buyers because I think that's like a very rewarding experience for everybody. A lot of sellers are like, where's my check? Where's my money at the end of the day? But your sellers are ecstatic with you. One, so the people who are working with you love you. Um, But then there are phrases. This is one of the reasons why I chose you. I was like, he's got to be on. He's got to explain this. It's because I heard on Instagram just a little splurb about wholetailing. And then you were talking about wholetailing and uh, wholesaling. And then I'm like, these are new. Like I've been in the industry for 20 years and I don't know what wholetailing is. And Brandon ruined it for me. He looked it up and and I said, don't, oh, I don't want to hear it from you. I want to hear it from Scott. So first tell us what, for those who may not know, what wholesaling is versus wholetailing and how it relates to the industry world or the real estate world. Yeah, we're, I feel like we're in uneasy times um, in real estate. And so it's forced investors to get creative on how to make deals pencil. Mm -hmm. And I think the concept of wholesaling has been super prevalent because of an, uh, a rising market. And Mm so you can get a deal under contract and Frankie and I have seen this happen tons of times on the investing side, you get in contract Mm -hmm. and within the 30 days, the prices have already gone up. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to quickly find an investor who's willing to purchase your interest in the contract. Mm -hmm. Meaning you don't have to have any money, you just need to have uh, really, really solid investor clients that you can say, if I go find a deal and I negotiate a fair price, I can turn around and sell my interest, essentially my service of finding the deal to you for a fee, Mm -hmm. right? So that's been prevalent for a long time. But in the last 18 months, we've seen our biggest rewards have come from wholetailing, which is one step removed from flipping and one step removed from wholesaling. It's right in the middle. Instead of assigning my interest to an investor client Mm -hmm. and selling it in contract, I close on the property as if I were to flip it. And then our business model, uh, we set it up where we list our properties for two weeks at a price that we would deem as fair. Hmm. And we open it up to the MLS, right? And when we meet with sellers, we say the best buyers list is the MLS. So we open ourselves up to that. Um, The properties that seem to do really well with that are the deals that we get a really deep discount because of their condition. Mm -hmm. And usually a contractor investor will come in, somebody who's going to do the work themselves. Or 
if they're financeable, like through a conventional loan, we'll find homeowners who want a DIY project, don't have much inventory to pick from, and they'll see it as an opportunity to get a home at, we typically list between 70 and 80% mm -hmm. of what the home's market value might be. Mm -hmm. So they see an opportunity to buy it, put in some sweat equity and gain some. So it's not necessarily just retail wholesaling because that is what Brandon told me it was. I think wholesaling doesn't require any money. And I think that leaves it to be the first step for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So you still have to have the capital to close on your transaction. And the caveat is you have to be comfortable knowing that if you don't get a price you like, you will have to take this project all the way. Mm -hmm. So we rarely buy wholesale projects over what we would pay as a flip. We're just deciding what exit strategy makes the most business sense for us. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it makes sense in like the volatile market that we're in right now, because I don't think really anyone has an idea where prices are going to go three, six, nine months from when you acquire a property. So the mindset is, hey, look, if I can acquire this property and hold it and then put it back on the market and still get some sort of return, fantastic, because I could end up in a project that's going to take me 30, 60, 90 days to renovate. And we could see a decrease in the market, you know, with rising interest rates. And now I'm not going to be able to sell it fully renovated for what I thought. And so there's a little bit more risk, I think, for investors right now in this current moment. So it does make sense as a strategy altogether. Yeah, it used to be you could just fix the house up. And by the time you were done fixing it, the prices had risen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been blessed. We've bought a lot of deals that we were able to still sell and, and bring back some profit. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple that we lost on. Um, and at this point, it makes sense for us. Uh, we run off of a general contracting model. So we don't have in-house construction crew that's just focus just on us. If we go into these spurts where, you know, in, in a month we buy 11 homes, we only have select contractors we want to work with, right? So they can only work on so many houses at once. So we start eliminating potential flip projects and saying, which one would make the most sense to wholetail right now? Because by the time our contractor is even available to get there, we're going to be you know, eight weeks down the road and then it's going to be six weeks and then we're going to list it and it's going to be potentially the same profit margin. Yeah. And I, so one of the things I think is super interesting to me about you as well is just kind of seeing your growth in the industry and like where you started and in where you've gone. In such a short period of time because you've been in the, you've been a licensed real estate agent for five years. Yeah, Sexy. July of 18. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's like, and I so I tell people all the time and people look at me kind of funny. I'm like, there's no right or wrong way to real estate. And there's so many different avenues mm -hmm. that you can get into and have success. I think initially when people get into real estate, it's like, oh, I get my license. I help people buy and sell. And then they don't realize. And then as they get into the industry and they start to say like, wait, I don't have to necessarily work with retail clients. I can work with investor partners. I can be an investor myself. And then you just start seeing all these different lanes. And we've met so many different people that have so much success in different avenues. And quite frankly, you've done a lot of them in different phases of your career. So kind of walk us through like where you started and what's kind of progressed to get you where you are today. Yeah, I so getting into real estate wasn't like a dream. Um, it was the result of just a couple years of school and realizing, you know, I had siblings that had done really well in college. They had done really well in high school. I by no means was a bad student. I just didn't love it. Um, and so I got in and the people that brought me into the industry were, you know, Benny Clay and Jason Pritchard. And they kind of opened up the idea of being an investor early on, but they started me as a realtor. And the idea was retail clients will lead to opportunities in the investment game. I don't know if it, if it truly played out that way, but being a realtor gave me a shorter uh, lag time, might be the right way to say it, to getting my first commission, right? I was living on my own. I had to figure out a way to pay the bills. I was working at a coffee shop. Being an investor, you know, it takes some time to get 
money back even if you are good at like getting a signed deal how much time would you say would be standard because i know with real estate agents it's like six months six months everyone says like at least six months of reserves has to be saved up before you earn your first commission what is it like from the investment standpoint i have a lot of new people on our podcast and and it seems to be there's kind of two options it's either you get kind of lucky at the start and you get into real estate investing because a deal falls in your lap and then you think about investing Mm -hmm. or if that doesn't happen to you you start working to procure a lead Mm -hmm. and it takes a year or two years to get your first profit. So versus as a, as a residential agent, I mean, you can typically get your first contract and get paid. Like you're saying, maybe in that six to eight month range. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you're learning, okay, what are the fundamentals of the market? What do people look for as a retail client, which is all helpful information when you're looking and analyzing a potential deal you're going to put your own money into. Mm -hmm. And I think there's tons of knowledge that just comes from being in the grind, doing any kind of real estate work, housing work, data, numbers, all of it helps everything. So you started with Benny and Jason and they were here at Iron Key. Yeah. So Iron Key was the first brokerage that you worked for. Yeah, I loved Iron Key. We were there. um, I started coming into the office in January of 2018. Okay. And then... Um, during COVID times, we ended up making a pivot. And to this day, I don't know if that was a great pivot, a bad pivot. It was just what we did. Mm -hmm. And being kind of just a member on a team, Mm -hmm. I remember being a little frustrated about the move because it felt like, why are we moving in unstable times? Mm -hmm. But I feel as if we've kept good relations with a lot of the people, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and since then I've even left where we pivoted to, and now I'm at a third brokerage. Mm -hmm. And I found that you know, the brokerage you're with has an effect on the stage of business you're in. Mm. So what do you like about Real Broker currently? Um, Real Broker's very hands-off. I think for a somewhat experienced, I wouldn't say I'm I'm an expert or like I don't need any oversight, mm-hmm. but for somebody who is wanting a little bit more space from the big office that most brokerages are, mm-hmm. uh, it's good for that. And it's also just very investor friendly. We've had we've had a lot of brokerages start to crack down on wholesaling. They're very nervous about uh, realtors buying deals, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so having a place that aligns with what your business model is is pretty important. Yeah. And I think we always tell people, yeah, yeah, you absolutely have to find a place that feels like home. Like everyone has like pros and cons as a brokerage and what you're looking for. And it's funny that you mentioned that, like that freedom, that ability to just kind of find your own space. One of the things that we love about Iron Key is that we do have our broker in the office and I got into this to be a real estate agent. I want to help people buy and sell real estate. And when it comes to like problems, issues, like it's nice to have my broker in his office right there that I can walk in and be like, Hey, if I'm running into an issue, BG, like you got it covered and we'll go from there. But again, it's, it's going to be different for everyone. So I think to your point, you almost have to kind of like make a move and see how different things function. Again, it might not have been the right move, but it gives you an opportunity to kind of see like, okay, where is this taking me? What does it feel like? What's good? What's bad? What works for me? Because we made a few moves before we landed at Iron Key. And now this is like, you know, forever for us, as long as, you know, BG will have us. But it's one of those things to where we learned a lot of things from a lot of places that we were at. Well, and I'll even say too, like when I was at Iron Key, I had a ton of deals that went south. And when you're a new agent, it's just, you're not cut to solve some of the problems you come into. Um, You referenced some of the Zillow comments that Mm -hmm. come from sellers. Mm -hmm. I've always (laughs) focused on listings. And, you know, when you're the listing agent, uh, your problems are very different than when you're a buyer's agent or when you're an investor. And so having a brokerage that has the support I think is important if you're somebody who hasn't seen a lot of problems as you start going you start seeing similar problems and you can call back how did we solve the last one but I remember lots of fun things about Brandon getting involved and solving a lot of complicated you know issues when I was at the start of my career what I love about Brandon too is and I've always said this to everybody is If you have an issue with somebody who's maybe doing a little bit of bullying or something, if you bring it up to Brandon, he'll spearhead it. You know, he'll call the person, like you said, five words, and he's like, who is it? And he's looking him up, and he's picking up the phone to call the broker and just get it dialed in. And you're like, oh, we're doing this right now? Okay, we're going to call people out right now. I have to say, 
I've always joked that real estate is the high school of the adult world. Yeah. <laughs> and I joke that a lot of people fall into real estate because they failed at their first career. Mm -hmm. And I picked real estate as my career mm -hmm. and that separates us. Mm -hmm. But when I was, you know, 19, I'm 26 now. I still look like I'm 16. <laughs> Obviously, when I first started, there were a lot of people that made a lot of judgments and and fair to them, I was new. Mm -hmm. But I remember multiple occasions people make comments when escrows were not perfect yeah. about my age or my expertise. And Brandon was quick on the phone saying, hey, if you don't like what he's saying, it's coming from me as well. So mm -hmm. how are you going to respond to that? Yeah. And that's what I love about being in Brandon's office. We have a lot of clients that come to us and they're always asking us about investing and i'm like we are actually not the right people to yeah talk that's to not about. i mean that's we'd... not our expertise and so there's like tons of questions i'm like we can ask scott those questions you can always tune <laughs> into the podcast so we do um admire you from afar always i've loved your growth i think that was one of the things that was near and dear to my heart is that you got started at age 19 i got started at age 19 so i shared that mutual like that I guess, like phase that you go through as a agent that you're trying to prove your worth. And I think a lot of my vocabulary, you know, became a little bit extended because I always tried to use bigger words and appeal. And then now that I'm older, so like when you get 40, they'll be like, you need to dumb it down. You need to use like simpler terms. Like you get to an age where they're like, they don't know what you're saying anymore or the terms or phrases are not what the client wants to hear or yeah. how they want to talk. Yeah. And I mean, Grace and spot on. I mean, we've always been like huge advocates of what you've done and what you're doing. And, mm -hmm. um, for me personally, like I was always able to relate because I was never like the most talented person in anything that I did, but I was always, I never shied away from the work. Like I was always willing to be like the hardest working person in the room. So naturally, even to this day, like when I see people who are just in there and working and again, Hey, I may not know everything yet. I'm going to figure it out. And yeah, you, you were right. When you walked down, I was like, like, this guy's got to still be in high school. Like, but look, he's on these phones. <laughs> he's knocking it out. Like, how does he even have his real estate license? And I was so confused, but I was naturally I was like, but man, he hustles, he works, he's yes. committed. And, and you know, in, in his, one of his reviews, it said that they visually saw him canvassing the neighborhood for potential prospects multiple times, Yeah, you know? And so it's no wonder that you're in acquisitions because I... you're in the trenches well and for anybody who's younger getting in the business like your parents friends aren't going to trust you with their most expensive <laughs> asset so i had to start by working with the people that hated realtors for sale by owners right oh, yeah. and it was like okay so it was trial by fire if i can work with these people uh -huh. and i can get them to trust me mm -hmm. how could i not get friends and family right yeah. Yeah. and over the years in the business, I mean, I've been blessed to have the opportunity to now be more selective. And, you know, I, I refer out a lot of my business that gets sent to me, not because there's any distaste for the person or anything like that, or mm -hmm. it's a money thing. It's just, I've made time commitments to other prospects and other properties. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I have a, a rule. If you worked with me mm -hmm. before this stage of my life, mm -hmm. I will do anything real estate for related for you that I can. Yeah. And so I have for sale by owner clients mm -hmm. that call me and say, my kid's looking to buy this house. And I don't care if they're pre-approved. I don't care if they're X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. That person trusted me before anybody. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give them 100% of what I have now because they, they put a deposit in and they'll mm -hmm. let the interest grow. Yeah. And, it, and it's so Definitely. powerful, right? Um, like you're spot on with just that kind of willingness to help especially when people who are willing to help you at a time when you were getting started. But I know to this day, like I have conversations with people who end up not selecting me as their real estate agent saying, Hey, we really appreciate the time, but we decided to go somewhere else. I'm like, fantastic. If that was a better fit for you, I support it 110%. If you ever have any questions or concerns and you just, need assistance in general like again i'm not your real estate agent but i always want to be a resource and i think just being willing to be resourceful to people out there who may have an issue in the future and just being available even though it's not tied to like an actual transaction it goes such a long way to just help people you know yeah you have to be people over profit which is really easily said very difficult to actually do but i mean we've had sellers you know listing clients uh, investment deals. They didn't work with us the first time around, but we left a lasting impact on them that when the next opportunity came up, 
they said, hey, I regretted not working with you for X, Y, or Z reason. I would like to give you the opportunity to help me on this. And I think that goes a long way with how you leave people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about structure. You had mentioned, you know, you've got time commitment set aside. I know Frankie is pretty good at like being in the office at 10, staying until 5, 6, 7 if needed, and having a very structured week. What does your schedule look like typically? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I joke, so Cade and I have worked together now for years, yes. and we own rentals together. And then Cade works with Jason as well now mm -hmm. as my counterpart in the operation side. Mm -hmm. um, we've been militant about our schedules and I am making some pretty drastic changes to how I'm structuring my life. I've mm -hmm. spent a lot of time grinding. I'm not out of the grinding phase, but um, getting married, buying a house, having know. commitments outside of work, I kind of need to adapt. Yeah. But for the last five years, it's been showing up between 7 and 8 a.m., um, 15 to 20 minute lunch around 11, and then working until my last appointment's done or the last follow up call is complete, right? We use a task system. I'm not super detail oriented, so um, everything goes through the CRM. And it's kind of like, well, whenever you can get that done, you can leave. Nice. So that's how it works a lot now. Um, I tell a lot of people, it's important to track your activities on your calendar just because in this market, it is really easy to feel busy but not be productive. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, the mornings are, for me now, they're saved for training the team, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not the guy on the phones these days uh, making the cold calls or answering the live leads. Mm -hmm. I'm more underwriting properties, making offers to sellers and helping negotiate and solve problems and then the afternoons are sent for appointments so Even how do though... you feel about that <laughs> right yeah so we that triggered both of us it's funny yeah. because to this day i think you're the best person on the phone i've heard mm -hmm. and i've heard a lot of quality people Even on the phone face, yeah knocking. but on the phone in particular because it's a it's a certain skill that a lot of people don't possess I'm me being one of them of but Graceland's good. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, she's way better than me as well. I, I'm horrible on the phones. But how do you feel leaving that, especially since we heard a call recently yes. that you posted on social media? I was supposed media. to actually greet you as we were that gonna person. <laughs> Graceland wanted to greet you as that person. I was like, it's probably not the best way to start the podcast. But the yeah. level of calm that you were able to keep, I mean, talk about the difficulty that you get from people and the pushback you get from people on the phone. And sometimes people are just flat out rude, but how you're able to not let it ruin your day. Cause I'm sure it did when you first yeah. got started. And he yeah, did, you did give a little bit of context on your Instagram yeah. and it was only a story. It was only a story, right? but on Friday we did a Friday mastermind. We do every other week and we actually shared, but I, you know, I couldn't find it. Like I didn't <laughs> have it anymore. And I couldn't, I have the recording it. on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so share a little bit about like the mindset or like the shift in your, like when did it happen? And I know you said earlier on in your early days, it probably would have been. And and just for context, days. like this person was being outright rude. Nothing. I think the only word he said was the F word multiple times, followed by a few fillers here and there. And it went on about for my like, mother. yeah, for like three, <laughs> yeah, for like three or four minutes, it felt like, and, and you it just, was my mom's like, birthday it's, too. You're like, it sounds like I caught you on a bad day. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, so you guys know me, I have a really crude sense of humor. Yeah. And so I don't know. I, I've been yelled at so many different times. Um, I think door knocking really was the thing that like got me to the point where I could just let somebody yell at me and I just wouldn't take it personally. Mm -hmm. It used to be, I would take it super personally. I'm an introvert by nature and I'm an extrovert by career. And so, um, you know, getting into the business, I just wasn't the kid that would necessarily always want to go talk to people. But I put in thousands, if not tens of thousands of reps, uh, reaching out blindly to people and asking if they wanted to sell. And I think, you know, when you're in that position, you deal with a lot of rejection. Mm -hmm. And so it used to ruin my day when that would happen. And then it got to the point where it was like, I remember this call that uh, a buddy on my team, man, Joke, got that just had the most vile voicemail ever, and he saved it. And I just thought that was so weird that he saved it. 
and he saved it so he could show me and Cade mm -hmm. the most heinous voicemail I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. And he's dying laughing. And I'm like, <laughs> this is really funny that this guy took the time out of his day mm -hmm. to call you off a mail piece and leave you this voicemail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it got to the point where it's like, okay, I'm not going to like torment people and like intentionally get them to yell at me. Yeah. But if you're having a bad day and you want to blow off some steam, you may say something funny that I'm going to use later. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, Cade and I use some of the stuff we hear from people on each other as inside oh, yeah. jokes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just listening to see if he has anything creative. <laughs> like, I mean, that guy, you know, wasn't the most articulate creative person ever. Yeah. It was a lot of uh, the, same, the same stuff over and over. But I mean, I'm sitting there. I had had a really hard day that day. Oh. And so it was just funny to me. I was sitting there and I'm like, he's the winner. Dude, I, I'm with you, bro. Like, <laughs> I want to do this to somebody like, oh. <laughs> I'm living vicariously through you. Keep going. Keep going. And I'm Can like, someone call me right now. <laughs> I'm like, sounds like I caught you on the wrong day. And he's like, ah, bah, bah, bah. and he's yelling at me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the the end of that story, because it, it had personal info. I didn't add it. Yeah. You hear at the end of my Instagram story, I kind of went silent. I said, OK. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's where I stopped the the video. Yeah. But what I was doing was reverse searching his phone number oh. to pull up his name. Oh. And I was like, is this? So and so at one two three Main Street, and he hung up. Oh my! God. And I died laughing. I died laughing because it was like the second he realized that, you that I he am a person who can figure out who you are. Where you I'm at. not just some guy that's just fielding phone calls. Yeah. He realized something and hung up. And then, you know, I messaged a team. I said, I'm not sure if it's this guy. He didn't ever confirm, mm -hmm. but can we just remove him from the list so that I don't have to deal yeah. with him again? I think yeah. it's so funny when you talk about like building thick skin through door knocking too. I'll never forget. I don't know if you remember, <clears throat> but it's definitely been in my mind for a long time. You used to walk door knock, you used to door knock really nice neighborhoods. And I remember one time I asked you to go door knocking with me and I took you to a little bit rougher neighborhood and you oh, knocked on this door and the big guy came and you thought he was <laughs> And you're like, I, I normally don't walk neighborhoods like this. So I had to like walk over and talk to him. And you're like, well, thank you for coming over. I wasn't sure if he was going to, because he thought you stole like an Amazon package. Yeah. So I had been stealing packages, and he was remember? a big dude. Oh, and I was yeah. still, what, 20? And oh, I was yeah. like a buck 50. And yeah. I had you with me. I felt like, I don't know. He had a reason to come talk to me. I, yeah. But he was, he he was, was upset. walking yeah. upset. And yeah. I knew this could get bad fast. <laughs> But since then, I've knocked on lots of horrible houses. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Like yeah. you said, you talk about progression. And I think it's one of those things, though. You just go out and, you know, you find what you're comfortable with. And then you open up your comfort level. And then you put yourself in more challenging situations. And at the end of the day, the more that you challenge yourself, the more success you're going to have. But you kind of start in this safe space. And then you just kind of stretch that. Like, how can I get uncomfortable? How can I get more well, uncomfortable? And I want to tag on to that. Even once you get to a level of success, like I had found a level of success as a salesperson mm -hmm. and I was like, well, this is really comfortable. Like, especially, you know, COVID, yeah. it was like, you know, you're, you're making hand over fist, houses are selling. I had always focused on listings. So, I mean, I was really happy because mm -hmm. this was easy. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting more and more and more into investing and then... I realized that I was making more money with the 20% of my time going towards investing than I was the 80% I was putting towards retail. And I said, it's really comfortable in retail, but I have to let it go. And I had just gotten married. And so I was like looking in the mirror and was like, well, I need to get uncomfortable. I know where I need to go. And I stopped prospecting for retail clients. And I kind of had to take that leap. And it was definitely difficult to get, again, uncomfortable after I had found some comfort after a few years mm -hmm. and restart kind of this whole journey. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about the the saturation in the investment portion of the business these days? Like, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's you because you and Jason have done a really good job about educating people. And I know Jason's been really big about partnering with a lot of people, holding, you know, a lot of like mastermind meetings and get togethers and really teaching people about the investment model. And you get to this point, I, I don't know, I feel like there's so many people who are investors out there now, and it's so competitive and it's so challenging for a lot of people in the industry to find deals. 
How do you feel about that space and where it's going and the just the sheer volume of people that are getting into investing in real estate or trying to wholesale or flip? And I feel like everyone's coming out of the yeah. world like investing. We want to invest. We want yeah. to build a. Well, uh, let me reverse the question. There's a lot of realtors. Mm -hmm. How are you guys holding up? Well, you know, it's funny that you had said that you actually found more experience in the, you know, investing side. I actually have opposite experience. So Frankie and I had attempted to do like a couple of like, it was deals that just kind of fell in our lap that made sense. We were trying to help everybody involved. And at, at the end of the day, after the taxes, after the time commitment and everything that we put into doing that, I could have just sold two houses. And, you know, we do like 10 to 20 transactions per month. So it's just like, okay, like, yeah, know, yeah, like, but back to your what are we doing? back to your question. Yeah, there there is a lot of realtors in the business. I think again, and it just kind of goes back down to work, focus, dedication. Um, like you're just not going to outwork us. We're going to be in the so office. That, he's We're saying do the same things. thing. Yeah. Like it's it's twofold. It's putting in the work. I think all the information that we're sharing is not new. We haven't reinvented the wheel. We've yeah. just put a couple spokes into a specific system mm -hmm. that we know works. Um, the second part to it is just, I mean, when you're in the business of buying properties at a discount, the person who can best convey their proposition value, who can best solve the seller's real life problems, and who can also come from a place of transparency and actually caring about the other person, they win. And so we typically buy property cheaper than some investors, but we treat people right and we get repeat clients. And um, there's very rarely a deal I go to that there's not other investors. And I normally am not the highest offer. We just have solved more complex problems and we've pivoted into the more and more and more difficult transactions. So what he's saying is it's just like us. When we go on a listing appointment, yeah. there are multiple people who may not give the highest price. We're not trying to buy your listing, but the services that we offer are going to eliminate a lot of issues along the way. Right. And <clears throat> I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's good for everybody involved that there's a lot of competition. I'm a massive believer in capitalism. And my opinion is the more competitors that are legitimate, and that have a personal code of ethics that, you know, aligns with taking care of people, the better off the seller is going to be, right? Yeah. And I think that there is a huge caveat about qualified investors who have a moral compass. But, I mean, if I go up against Frankie and he and I are both bidding on the same home, I feel pretty good that whoever the seller picks, they're going to walk away with the best deal they possibly could have gotten and they were treated fairly. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to be said for that too, right? I, I mean, there's a lot of people that I respect and love in the industry. And there's a lot of times where I'll go into an appointment and someone will tell me some of the other agents that they're interviewing. And I'm like, hey, you can pick any of us and you're gonna be good. Like, I'll tell you right now, like if I'm not the person, I'm very happy with the agents that you've interviewed. Like, that's awesome. Like, and so I think you're absolutely right. When you know certain people in the industry that are providing that highest level of service, um, it's nice to see that you're in those same rooms. Like I kind of take it, um, as a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like I'm grateful that I, that I get to be in that room with those people. Like they view me in that light. It's kind of camaraderie. Yeah. I mean, I was even down at the probate court. I have never sat in on a, a probate hearing cause, um, we buy a lot of probate, but typically they're full authority and it's just like a direct sale. But we had one where it wasn't. And we were made aware that there was going to be an overbidder, right? It's like an auction. Mm -hmm. And when the attorney called me, he referenced who it was and I knew him. And I chuckled because I was like, I mean, Fresno is a small world. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised I know him. And when we were sitting in the court, he walks in. I recognize him right away. He walks over, sits with me. And, you know, the we were both ignorant to how it worked. We thought he was calling for attorneys. We thought the judge was calling for attorneys. He was calling for bidders. He goes to authorize my sale at the price I had it at. And we both raised our hand and I pointed at this guy and was like, hey, your honor, we, we do have an overbidder. I ended up paying $9,000 more. Mm -hmm. That goes in the pocket of the seller I'm working with. Mm -hmm. He got an opportunity to try to get the deal. We mm -hmm. ended up securing it. 
And either way, I knew walking away that the seller was going to get a better price than what I originally thought I could pay. Yeah, your guys is, <clears throat> excuse me again, your guys is a level of knowledge of the investment side of the industry never fails to impress me. Like there's so many times I call you on a deal because again, I'm not big into the flip industry personally, but we do own a couple of rentals and I'm definitely more of a buy and hold person like long term and there's certain areas that I target. But there's so many times I hop on the phone and I tell you about something I'm looking at and you're like, oh yeah, I looked at it like three weeks ago and you're like, this many people own it. They're trying to sell it for this price. I'm like, dude, how do you know everything before I even come close to sniffing it out? Like mm -hmm. you're so, you guys are awesome when it comes to that. You just- And do you personally have an investment portfolio of your own? Yeah, and we're adding to it right now. Um, I've got a couple houses in Indiana, and then um, my wife and I are buying a triplex in Birmingham right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm flying out there, and then uh, simultaneously, we're looking at a tenplex uh, in Birmingham. Nice. Yeah. So how do you select the locations that you're going to invest in? Um, I'm not tied to California. I think the laws make it so difficult. Like just on the investing side, I we deal with so many evictions, so many squatters. Um, you know, most of my family's moved. So I look really just for where I can find people that I trust and where the numbers make sense. So, I mean, for me, I'm not super tied down to one location. It's, you know, it's, does the asset itself make sense? Mm -hmm. I wish I could be that confident investing outside of an area that I can't physically drive to <laughs> get uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'll tell you this. Yeah. I pulled the baseboards off of my house. Mm -hmm. I'm never doing that again. Why? I'm just, I am not built oh. for the patience and the, the toll on your body <laughs> it takes to do any construction. I will never touch one of my rentals. Mm -hmm. I'm just, yeah. I would rather pay for it. And like you mm -hmm. said earlier, just sell more houses mm -hmm. than try to do it myself. So for me, mm -hmm. it actually is beneficial. It keeps me, out of the way for mm -hmm. my property managers. I can relate to that. We redid the flooring in our personal property and I got a quote to demo the flooring and I'm like, no, I'll do it myself. Uh, no, thank you. And then I ended up spending three days there by myself pulling up flooring and I was, it was horrible. And yeah. you do the math on how yeah. much you make a year and yeah. how much your time costs yeah. and you realize, <laughs> wow, I'm doing that right now. I'm yeah. like, I could have spent 800 bucks to remove those. And instead I spent 10 hours. Yeah. I screwed up my hands multiple times. I broke one of the walls on accident. <laughs> like everybody in my office is laughing at me. They're like, Scott, you, Just hire somebody. you did that over 800 bucks. Like, what yeah. are you thinking? Yeah. Right. So yeah. Learning lesson for me and for it you. Is. Yeah, definitely. So now that we are wrapping up the episode, where can people find you if they want to talk to you more? Is it better to go on Instagram or YouTube or where where are you found? Super easy. Uh, just Scott Farrow, Instagram or Facebook. Uh, Instagram messages, you're going to get a better response rate just because the app's all in one. Mm -hmm. um, or you can follow our YouTube if you want to see ongoing content. So Pursuit of Property Podcast. Mm -hmm. And that's on you know Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Scott, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time. Mm -hmm. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm sure thank we'll you so have much. you back at some Good point. Good to see you guys. Yeah, yeah. You thank too, you man. for the invite. Uh -huh. Awesome.